वैसे लेकिन मैंने देखा आप सेंट जेवियर कोलकाता से आपने अपना कॉलेज राइट आप क्या कोलकाता से हैं या फिर यस यार आई वाज ब्रॉट अप इन कलकत्ता अब इशारा दे आस्क यू दिस वन थिंग ऑनेस्टली व्हाट डू यू मिस द मोस्ट अबाउट लाइक समथिंग दैट इज वेरी पर्टिकुलर टू कोलकाता इटसेल्फ लाइक फ्रेंड्स वगैरह तो ठीक है वो लोग भी कर यस थैंक यू सो मच आई आई एम जस्ट अज्यूमिंग यू एंड आई शेयर द सेम एंगर when someone compares puchka to golgappa or pandey like it's not the same thing <laughs> i agree yaar you can't compare the two that i agree no debate there whatsoever so hello prashant welcome to my podcast mood posting hours and it's a privilege to have you here my pleasure But before we get started here, Prashant, I want to ask you one thing. What is the one question that you get asked the most? <laughs> uh, not a easy question, but I, if you reflect, if I reflect back on my twenty-five years that I've spent uh, uh, in the finance world, investing, uh, whether it was with Kishore Biyani or Rakesh Junjunwala, uh, mm-hmm. one of the most common questions that keep people keep get asking me is which company to invest in. because they all feel <laughs> investing is so easy and uh, everybody is over here wanting to get rich quick everybody looks either for a tip or something they may word it differently but the essence of their question is exactly this uh, prashant which company should i invest in and it's interesting uh, that that question has not changed in the 25 years that i've spent in financial markets here yeah and i think with the new tv shows and movies which have come up very recently <laughs> that question has only grown more frequent true yaar so prashant how about we reverse engineer this whole thing how about instead of mm. telling people that you know you should invest in this company that company how about we tell them how to build a company that other people would want to invest in yaar as i say na kaise pakdo ko udhar se pakdo answer will emerge broadly in that same zone same horizon but yes this is something interesting uh i have done a few podcast and a few uh, lectures never been asked uh, to present how to invest in a in a reverse engineered manner uh but yeah. let me try and kind of give it a shot so before we go ahead i want to give you an opportunity to introduce your own corporate career to our audience because you know i think no one can describe yourself better than you can right so please Thank you, Harsh. Hi, friends. Uh, thanks for listening in. Uh, my name is Prashant Desai. Uh, I am 49 years. I am a chartered accountant and a cost accountant. I started my career in the financial markets, in the stock markets, way back in 1995. Started my career as a equity research head for a firm in Calcutta called United Credit. Uh, worked there for many years, researched and met a lot of companies and management. uh from there on i moved and joined a, a financial communication agency in calcutta called trisis communications where we used to write research based annual reports for a lot of indian corporates like reliance mittal steel balrampur chini lupin matrix so on and so forth and one of the persons uh, one of the companies that i used to write a uh, annual report was pantaloon retail uh, founded by kishore biyani and i was very close to mr biyani and in one of those days uh, i always wanted to move to bombay because I, i used to love equity markets and i told him that i want to move to bombay and then he offered me a job so in 2003 i left calcutta came to bombay and joined kishore biyani's pantaloon retail as head of investor relations where my job was to uh, market the pantaloon stock and raise capital for kishore biyani and pantaloon retail i worked with him for 3 years uh, and in one of the placements that i did that we did uh one of our large investors was rakesh junjunwala uh and when rakesh junjunwala decided to institutionalize himself uh he offered me a job to join him and uh, i joined rakesh junjunwala as head of his research in 2006 worked with him for a couple of years uh after that uh, i left him and moved back to pantaloon retail by that time pantaloon retail had become future group and at that time i used to look at not just the investor relations but investing where we invested in a lot of emerging consumer businesses like diva and turtle so on and so forth and i was head of investments for a for a listed companies of a company of future group called future ventures which is now future consumer products uh, 
Uh, subsequent to that, uh, I was seconded on the asset management side of Future Group, which was a joint venture between Kishore Biyani and Samir Sen. Uh, I then moved on to Indivision, the private equity fund, worked there for a few years. Uh, I left them and then I joined a technology company in Bombay uh, called Financial Technology, which was the promoter of MCX, Indian Energy Exchange, Dubai Golden Commodity Exchange and so on. I joined as president, uh, investment relations and mergers and acquisitions there. I joined FT in December 2012. I went on to become the CEO and MD of FT uh, in 2014. And I led that business for three years till 2017. In 2017, I left uh, FT to start my own entrepreneurial journey where I started India's first and only truly sports brand called Defy. I started this with the former managing director of Puma called Rajiv Mehta. Uh, we tried everything. <laughs> we tried to do our best, but in three years time, uh, unfortunately, the, the business did not succeed. And we folded the business in August 2019. And then I kind of moved on from there. And I joined Everstone, the private equity firm, which was earlier called Indivision, where I was part, which I was part of. And I joined Everstone in 2019. Uh, 19 September and since then I am with Everstone. Currently I am seconded into uh, Burger King as Head of Strategy and Investor Relations. So yeah, that's been my journey. Oh, that's that's a fantastic journey and that's a very, uh, I, I like the fact that you know you took a lot of risks in your complete journey Prashant because <laughs> I, I see a lot of stability and you stepping out of your comfort zone and that is very appreciable, that is very applaudable. Thanks, Arsh. Thanks. Yeah, so let's try and... One thing I tell people is, yeah, it's important, uh, you know, not just which company you, you invest in, but who's the person who has started this company and why. The why for me becomes a very important uh, point. And I'll tell you, uh, interestingly, so normally they say you should start a business or become an entrepreneur. If, you know, you are passionate about a product, or if you are very passionate about a service, or there is a problem in the in the world which you think you can solve, uh, and what I have realized is if you if you if you don't have any of these uh, either of these three, uh, chances are that uh, you know uh, you may not be able to build a very successful business because if you go through the common thread amongst people who have been very successful, they've been passionate about uh, what they are doing. And then there are a lot of people who actually build the business uh, just because they think this business may probably fetch a certain value or, uh, you know, just because there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity to do 20,000 things. But if you're not passionate about that, uh, at some level, uh, you will try to kind of stumble. So my first point I kind of try and ask uh, is what problem are you trying to solve uh, in that sense? Uh, that becomes my starting point. If you want to build a business where you want people to invest in, they should see that passion in you that you want to solve that problem. Yeah, right. So uh, one thing that I have also established is that you need to have a vision to your, uh, and you need to have an end game there. You can't just start a company on and expect key, you know what, as we are going through it, we'll figure out. Like, it's not that the destination is something that you'll figure out on your journey. You need to at least have some vision of what you want to achieve with your company because the startup culture, Prashant, in very recent times has become very cool okay it's not it's it's a very get rich quick scheme because we are seeing people raising funding and their company is getting valued at an x amount which is huge and it's just a very lucrative option but uh, yeah i think i completely agree with your point where that you know the vision that drives a person and the person who's driving the company they both become a very important part over here you start a business because there is a problem that you want to solve and that problem that you want to solve is not letting you sleep. Okay. Once you decide what problem you want to solve and if it doesn't let you sleep, you become an entrepreneur and try and solve that problem. Uh, you start taking a small step. Where that step will lead to is next. What you read about in papers, people raising valuation. Uh, nobody gives capital to vision. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have a saying uh, in our private equity business that vision without execution is hallucination. So I have not seen a single entrepreneur, even in this crazy today's world, 
where vision will get backed by money no it doesn't happen money yeah. will only chase execution uh, so if you cannot execute the vision that you are building you have no hope in hell to even raise one rupee and execution is comes from your passion how how badly do you want to solve the problem uh, i may have if somebody tomorrow you know builds a business because his vision is to you know make a unicorn and at that time he will exit there is no hope in hell for that person because unicorns don't get built overnight uh, unicorns get built because there is a problem you are solving and you have demonstrated to the investing public that you have executed in solving the problem at some scale you take the example of baiju what is the problem yeah. that baiju was trying to solve baiju was trying to solve the problem that in india there are plethoras of schools where the quality of education is very poor he could mm. not take his expertise of teaching to millions of people because he used to teach in a small school where there about 200 300 students and people will line up and queue up to kind of take his tuitions he meets ravindra pai of manipal who sees this mm. passion in him and he says yaar the way you are teaching needs to go to millions of people gives him small capital and tells him you are solving a problem the problem is much bigger than what you are envisaging this is not a problem of your village this is a problem of this country can you and i join hands and solve this problem big way how do you do this through technology by converting the content into and it is only when he converted his knowledge into content got a few hundred thousand students then where the funding started coming so the mm-hmm. vision for me uh, does not hold too much of a of a grandness for me when we invest if you want somebody else to invest in your business your proof of concept has to be strong your execution has to be strong every day when you go to sleep you should you know you, there should be a certain amount of urge to wake up and go back and and do something else the next day to solve the same problem that you were seeing so vision or an end in mind uh, uh is not the best way to attract investment but execution the fact that this is the problem this how this is how big the problem is and this is what i have done to solve this problem yet i maybe have taken the first step to solve the problem there are 1000 more steps that's what we in investing world call it as an opportunity how big is the problem and is this problem getting bigger and which is what baiju tried to explain to investors that guys every single day there are x number of kids being born in a country like india my market keeps growing not every day but every second because there are x number of uh, birth taking place in a country like india after about 8 or 10 years this is the fodder for my business now if you look at it from an investor's perspective he has a market which is not yeah. just big but it's also growing every single day Mm. and yet he is currently a leader by far in his ability to connect with the students his execution has been so far very good so i will put money in this and what started at at a 500 crore valuation last he was valued at 18 billion dollars the yeah. the jump from 500 crores to 18 billion did not happen because of vision it happened because of execution so to me a uh, vision has no meaning it's only execution hmm. execution execution so when we say this execution uh, let's say if we have a startup which is selling a product or a service uh, so okay. as an investor and if let's say we are going for the first round of investments so i have hmm. seen that many people and there there have been many so the problem of current internet is that we have a lot of information by a lot of people who are very underqualified to talk about it right hmm. so we have seen this lot there there is just so many blueprints and there are so many prototypes of how to build a startup where they say that you know mm. if you are going for an investor you need to have a foolproof plan but in that mm. foolproof plan there are two major components uh, that i feel are very less talked about and not talked about in too much detail one mm. being the actual working prototype and actual results like you know a, a mm. proof of concept as you said right your product mm. you should you know at least b- build a prototype of a product and test it out you should hmm. believe in the actual uh, you know result or evaluation of the product before you can get someone else to believe in it hmm. 
and mm. the second is the very important part which actually precedes the first one it is market research mm. so as a as a person who's creating a product prashan and mm. uh, in the later part of the podcast we're also going to talk about your book where you've talked a lot about your own venture but mm. i think this is one part that you also emphasized was which was market research right so how do you mm. go about it and what is what should be the right approach towards it and there cannot be a common approach to that first you have mm-hmm. to figure out or identify what your product or your services basis that you start doing some work see mm-hmm. first level is always anecdotal evidence okay mm-hmm. so in mm-hmm. my case when i started my sports sneaker business or a sports shoe business i wanted to give india a truly indian sports brand like a nike but an indian mm-hmm. nike uh, much more affordable Uh, the anecdotal evidence that i got when i was i am i was a half marathoner and i would run with uh, a group of 120 people uh, mm. the anecdotal evidence at that point of time was that people were looking for alternatives to a nike or adidas reebok puma which were expensive uh, yes. so you start by whatever your product or service is to search for anecdotal evidence to see whether a, a problem exists or not you mm. talk to people you go and meet people and when i say people what who you think could be your customer for the product or the service and test that hypothesis yaar i see this is a problem and i think this is a very large problem i can solve do you see this as a problem so your first level of research starts with talking to your friends or families or whoever are your you think are the customers for for that product or for that service once you right. start getting uh, a lot of uh, positive response to that yaar sahi mein problem hai sahi mein problem hai mm. yaar maybe ye soch raha tha types you start begin to get a sense that okay i think i am in the right direction then you take it one notch higher when you take it one notch higher you ask your friends and families uh, to probably then introduce you to 50 or 100 people who they mm. know and you will then go and meet these people and talk about the same thing and that time when you go to go and meet and talk them you have a small some kind of a question there to which you are seeking answers the problem exists in your head you've got the first round of a tick by talking to your close friend that that problem exists now I'm enlarging my sample size to say 100 150 people yes one thing you have to be very sure is you go to that 100 150 people who you think could be your target customers lot mm-hmm. of times we intellectualize the problem i will go to people uh, who may not be my customers at which point mm. of time i may get replies but those replies are not relevant to me and i'll give you my yeah. example when i was doing my research i went and spoke to 100 150 people who were like me whereas when i made the product at the pricing i was not my own customer i and write i write about this mistake in my book that mm. i thought i was my own customer for my product whereas i was not i was targeting mm. somebody who was earning 20 30000 rupees a month so i was mm. not my own customer so when you increase your sample size to do your research you should ensure that you are going to the right audience who you think your customer is if at that point of time you think okay i think we are these out of this 150 people that i met i think 100 120 people feel this problem exists that's mm. where somewhere you get your eureka moment the boss yes. kuch to dumb hai apne uh, idea mein and that's where you start thinking about what is your next step in terms of building that prototype for me uh, you know your proof of concept is extremely critical and for that proof of concept you have to put your own money that's another right. thing that is important you should have skin in the game a lot yeah. of people want to do and i get written after i have written the book uh, people write to me i want to start a business can you fund me Yes. Then I ask him, why do you think your business will succeed? And they will give me a fifteen-minute commentary on how good their business is. And then I ask them, if so good is your business, why don't you put your house on mortgage and put money and start? Mm. No, 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 that is very risky. Yeah, right? <laughs> your own money is risky. My money is not risky. No, sir. You have a lot of money. Oh, you have a lot of money. You have a lot of money. You have a lot of money. Yeah. So I think these are some of the things people have to understand. People who yeah. are extremely passionate about the product or service, or they really think they have something, 
the last thing they want is an investor because they don't want to dilute too early yeah it was the same case with me when i started my business i put everything that i earned in the last 25 years into it because i think i had uh, three assets with me teen ikke the mere paas teen ikke to baaji apne ko jitni hai agar mere ko baaji jeeti hai to main dusre ke sath kyun share karu apne returns absolutely so these are some of the things uh, people need to consider uh, before that because these are some of the questions the investor will ask hmm. if i go and say or i have i am from a respectable wealthy family or i i have some amount of capital but i don't even want to put that to risk to build the prototype shows me how confident or non confident you are about the product or the service absolutely and i think this is a very good point that you have raised here prashant because most people don't realize that this if you let's say if your idea is good right and if you're scared because hum log ke mind mein na ek we have this very motherly approach towards money right so people they are very confident in their idea but they still scared to put their money at risk what they don't realize is if they actually realize that their idea is good they have tested it out on a very small scale without actually an active investment if they are getting an investor for an amount that they can actually afford they are actually sharing the like you know they are sharing the fruit of their labor with someone else which is not really the best thing to do an investor is something that should come in when you think that you know it's something that i can't achieve on my own but at least Correct. you know if have some support would actually get me to an xyz position which would be beneficial absolutely for me. absolutely yeah. so i'll give you another example yesterday somebody had come to meet me okay uh these two guys have started a pizza chain in chandigarh okay hmm. and the thought came from the fact that uh, uh the pizza that they were eating in chandigarh uh, whichever uh, you know uh, hmm. qsr you want to name i think yep. those pizzas had a lot of oil in it uh, they hmm. were not using cheese they used mayonnaise etc 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 the pizzas were very heavy you can call it junk right yeah and uh, he says no i want to now create a pizza chain where the pizzas are authentic where i hmm. don't use mayonnaise i will use cheese where i will yeah. not use preservative wala sauce i will actually put the tomatoes in the oven live so that they burst and the hmm. sauce gets made inside the oven my hmm. dough will be from heirloom wheat i will hmm. do all of this and my pizzas will still be the same price as dominos or pizza hut okay yeah so the problem that i am trying to solve is everybody wants to eat pizza but there are not enough options available for a uh, i won't even use the word healthy pizza but for an authentic pizza yeah but pizza is pizza right yeah uh, he started with two outlets and he came to meet me he wanted some advice on he exactly the same i have two outlets i want to now replicate this to 20 outlets and 20 outlets to 200 outlets and there is a pizza chain called la pinios Uh, which yeah. has done extremely well in Gujarat, and you know, I want to. I said, okay, this is a vision. Ki baat nahi karta, apne execution pe aate, right? So <laughs> I asked the boss, "Bata, how many people are eating your pizza every day? What is your check size? What's your gross margin? What are your expenditure? Are you making money on the two chains, etc., etc., etc." So two pizza chains in Chandigarh are doing well now. They are coming to Bombay. Hmm. so i asked them and both were uh, reasonably well to do kind of uh, bande and they yeah. came through somebody i know so i knew they were financially decently off right <laughs> so i said bombay mein pizza kahan lagaoge bola bandra mein turner road mein jagah bhi dekh li hai uh, so i said how can i help you ke investor chahiye mere ko hmm. so i said uh, why investor chahiye to bolta nahi yaar wo investor aa jayega mere ko do pizza ki chain lagani hai to do ke char ho jayenge then i want to take it to 20 तेरी दो पिज्जा चेन चंडीगढ़ में जो लगी है उससे थ्री एक्स पैसा चाहिएगा टू ओपन इन बैंड्रा ऑन द सक्सेस ऑफ जस्ट टू चेन्स यू वॉन्ट समबडी टू पुट मनी इन बैंड्रा आई सेड हाउ कॉन्फिडेंट आर यू ऑफ ऑफ योर पिज्जा चेन बींग सक्सेसफुल एंड ही साउंडेड सुप्रीमली कॉन्फिडेंट एज इफ बॉम्बे इज नॉट सीन अ पिज्जा चेन आई इफ यू आर सो कॉन्फिडेंट अबाउट इट वाई आर यू नॉट पुटिंग मनी and believe me it didn't strike him because his hmm. mindset was always about moving from 2 to 20 to 100 he was thinking hmm. investor the moment yeah. i brought him from 20 pizza after 3 years to today 
and i said mm. boss whether you are able to raise money for the 20 pizza chain can only be done if your bandra outlet does well yeah. so for you your make and break moment is the bandra outlet if your bandra outlet does not deliver the kind of numbers boss you will mm. not get money for your fourth pizza so then i asked him how do you think your bandra outlet can be profitable and he came to giving me ye karenge i said nahi the only way it can get profitable is you have so much skin in the game that you will do everything in your control to make it profitable i said the only way to do it is whatever savings you have put it over here mm. when you know your existence depends on this bandra ka pizza chain because mm. you will work so hard to make it work and if the bandra pizza chain is successful your then ability to raise money becomes even more easier your not just your success of your pizza chain in its future depends on bandra your future depends and if your future depends on your bandra unit of pizza chain put every penny that you have even if you have to bloody go and sell your mom's jewelry sell it and put it because jab tak wo piche mein aag nahi lagegi na इंपॉर्टेंसोगे so yeah and sometimes it's important to put everything that you have at risk because hmm. that's only uh, is a demonstration of you know one what is your belief in that idea and if that is your belief you will do everything to make it happen and if you can do that if your proof of concept hmm. does well then there will be enough people to put money behind you because now they know uh, you know the proof of concept that execution is there yeah So Prashant, uh, this one example that you have said, which is by the way an excellent example, it brings this another uh, top, uh, you know, just uh, area in my head, which is globalization versus innovation, right? In today's world, innovation, like most of the startup ideas that come up, they are mostly on globalization, because people see an existing idea working in a very small space, which is not theirs, and then they try to make, you know, take it to other places and make it bigger. right or they'll see an idea performing really well in one sector like they'll see e-commerce working well on amazon then they'll start e-commerce but for pillows e-commerce but for a uh, t-shirt e-commerce but for water bottles and what not so what is your take on that because it's it's i like what i think if if you want to actually succeed in the longer run both ideas are not bad globalization would get you the same stuff as an innovation would but how does it differ in an aspect of a smooth sailing there you must read this book by manish pobrai called dhando investor mm. and it answers your question and he has mm. been a long time follower of warren buffett and his book okay. he makes that point that you don't need to be an innovator to create wealth mm. okay you can be a copier of an idea and create massive wealth and the biggest example he talks about in his book is reliance industries okay mm. from dhirubhai ambani to today mukesh ambani and every single business that you can think of reliance not one business has been an original idea seeded by reliance okay mm-hmm. right from textiles which was the domain of bombay dyeing during dhirubhai days yeah to going backward from textiles to crude oil mm. to starting jio to starting retail they were never num- they were never the first one yep. so they started after the ideas merit was proven hmm. but once they started reliance is an execution engine it's not a vision engine it's an execution yeah. engine they bloody yeah. execute so better than anybody else that they are leagues ahead of others and their ability to think very big so i am yeah. not of the world that if if there is an idea if you can make that idea work whether it is in a, another industry or in the same industry itself but if you can make it work you have to always remember do you know which is the largest com- company in the world today amazon 
Do you know what is Amazon's market share of US retail? It's less than 4%. Okay. Which means 96% Americans are still buying things not from Amazon. Okay? Despite Amazon being now almost the size of India in terms of its market cap. Their GDP, yeah. their India's GDP is 2.4 trillion. Amazon's market cap is now 2 trillion dollars. Right? Mm. right? Despite being so large, they are so small. So it doesn't matter if you can even replicate an idea that's worked for somebody else, but do it well. In any mm. business and industry, you see there will be room for three, four players. So yeah. I am not of that idea that you have to be an innovator to create wealth or create value. But when you are somebody who is copying somebody else's idea, your mm. execution has to be very, very powerful. I'll give you an idea. We have an investment in a, I'll give you an example. We have an investment in a, in a company called API, which is uh, Farm Easy, the app. Okay. Mm. What did Siddharth and his uh, colleagues or friends do? They put up a e-commerce platform for medicines. Mm. Right. What is the problem that they were solving? The problem that they were solving was so many pharmacies, all these pharmacies selling you fake medicines. You don't mm. know what you are buying. And always there is this problem of going to a pharmacy, kabhi dawai milegi, kabhi nahi milegi, etc, mm. etc, etc. And this phar- the pharmacies that were there, these pharmacies mm. did not have the power because they were fragmented. So they could not mm. negotiate with the pharma companies for better margin. Comes Siddharth and his team creates an mm. e-commerce platform, but focused only on medicine. I become the yeah. e-pharmacy of India. Yeah, it's the same idea what uh, Jeff Bezos did. Jeff Bezos right. did with a lot of other things. He did mm. the same idea, and his three pillars are identical to Amazon. Mm. My medicines will be the cheapest. Mm. I will give you the best customer service, mm. and come what may, I will have the widest choice of medicines. In medicine. He's become so big that even Amazon cannot compete with him in India. So idea he borrowed, he put yeah. it to a different industry, but his execution was so flawless that today mm. he's worth whatever, four or $5 billion. So that's the point. The point is not on yeah. the idea. It's on your ability to think big and execute the idea. Right. I think another great example of this would be what Google did, right? Because it came in a market which was you know, it was it was taken over it and standing out over there would have been so difficult. But then it uh, comes like there were Yahoo and then comes it and it's just takes the entire thing by the storm where, you know, a company that, that the company with that once tries to purchase it was it's, it's it doesn't even exist anymore. Right. So it's it's just that I completely agree. But then in this in this particular scenario, Prashant. How do we how do we look at monopolies, and uh, you know and and how do we compete with the competition? Because there is one thing which you said about the pharmacy part, where they have they had reached a ground of perfect competition, right? Where if they are all, always uh, they are so fragmented and they are always competing with each other, that a third party always benefits from that. Same happened with Microsoft and Google, where they kept com- uh, competing, and Apple is the one that profited off of the complete market. And same is happening as you in the, in the example you stated. How do you as a company avoid that in whichever sector that you're going? And, and if your sector has a complete uh, a current monopoly, what should be your approach to deal with it? Because a lot of people as get very scared. In the world of business, it's ruthless. Yeah. It's yeah. the survival of the fittest. Yep. Either you become sharper, more efficient, serve the customer better, or the customer will move. It doesn't matter what business you are in, B2B or B2C. Hmm. If the customer has another person giving you better choice, better pricing, better customer service, he will move. But if you continue to provide him good quality, good service, good pricing, why will he move? So the best way to compete is to become bigger. Scale will give you so many advantages which nobody else will have. And which is your game? How big can you think? How big can you become? When Mukesh Bansal and Bini Bansal set up Flipkart, 
or for that matter uh, any any of these unicorns that have become really big uh, mm. zomato went public just now what is dipinder's uh, holding in the company 5% what mm. is mukesh bansal bini bansal's holding in flipkart when they sold out to walmart same 4 to 5% mm. so they realized that in this business if i have to survive i have to grow very big if i have to right. grow very big i will need to raise capital i will keep getting diluted mm. but my survival is at stake if my cost of survival is growth i will grow at any cost and if Absolutely. i grow at any cost i will get diluted but the game that i am trying to play and only time will tell whether you are successful or not is when you scale and grow this big and when the company becomes really very large you may end up owning owning only 5% of that business you would have created wealth for 95% of the people Yeah. but that's a choice you make because you yeah. know if i want to own 40% of the business and the business remains very small the likes of amazon will come and eat you and yeah. that's the vision that you talk of i read a book called jonathan livingston seagull by richard bach and there is a very beautiful line in that book which says the gull that flies highest sees yeah. farthest so these are things that you can't imagine when you are starting the business all mm. these thoughts will naturally come to you as you become bigger and bigger because as you become bigger and bigger you start facing bigger competition you will start thinking differently so somebody who starting today a business venture does not need to think too much about all of this his first thing is to establish himself and ensure that he doesn't die if yeah. he remains alive in the jungle he will figure out a way to survive and as he moves more into denser jungle the animals will be different but because he is now migrated into denser jungle he is also become stronger so he will know he will have the means to fight you take the example of the snap deal founders kunal and rohit both these guys they had a similar business model like flipkart at some point of time they realize here we are getting diluted too much at some point of time they faltered on their execution yeah and they lost this battle because at that point of time we were only talking of flipkart and snap deal amazon yeah. was still way behind in the picture so that yes. is what happens yes. in competition in business it's a bad big bad world out there the small will get eaten the small will get finished and there is no easy way to say either you shape up or you ship out absolutely so one another thing prashant here is that what role does advertising and marketing play in your uh, individual growth apart from the rest of it I, i mean these factors are definitely something that are worth considering but when it comes to advertising and market placement of a product how big of a role does that play out massive and i can't even start on this mm. uh, again of course it will depend on which product if you are in an industrial product absolutely no no point but if yep. you are in a consumer facing product the more amount you spend on marketing over a longer period of time that is your glue that gets a customer you tell me uh, my father invested in colgate palm olive way back in 1970 okay mm. during the colgate palm olive ipo in india from 1970 right. we are in 2021 41 years of uh, 51 years can mm. you imagine the amount of money colgate has spent on advertising every year why is colgate a household name today right. if colgate stops advertising will you stop buying colgate absolutely no but colgate does that because there is something called as a lifetime value of a customer what is the lifetime value of a customer is his affinity towards your brand mm-hmm. foreign buffett has said when he bought gaico as a business in us mm-hmm. he says he in one particular year of gaico they spent 190 million dollars in marketing or advertising and because of that gaico made a loss so warren buffett in his letter to his shareholder wrote that if i will spend only that many dollars in marketing which gets me a new customer whose lifetime value to me as a business is more than the money i am spending 
He said, I am disappointed we only spent $190 million. I should have sent $400 million. But unfortunately, after $190 million that we spent, the incremental yeah. dollar that I was spending was not getting me a customer whose lifetime value to my business was $1. And he right. says, this is the biggest uh, thing a business can do. Look at Titan today, Tanishq yeah. today. There are so many jewelers in this country, right? Right. Why has Tanishq become so big? Because of their investment in brand. And the name Tata represents trust. So you are, uh, if you have a consumer facing business, hmm. you have to invest in brand. I don't say marketing expenditure. It is an investment. I work for Burger King. In Burger King, hmm. we are mandated to spend 5% of our revenues on marketing. It's hmm. part of the contract. Mm. Why? Because the longevity of the brand Burger King is a function of every month that I spend money and take Burger King brand to television. The day I right. stop this, my customer will start eating somewhere else. And I don't yeah. even want to lose that one customer. So it is extremely important. When we were analysts, when I used to work with Rakesh Junjunwala, mm. we used to look at EBITDA of a company or the operating profit of the company, we used to see operating profit before marketing mm. expenditure. That was the real operating profit. There was mm. a year, I remember, when Dabar was under so much of pressure by analysts because they were not mm. showing higher profits that Dabar decided for two years to reduce their marketing spend. Okay? Mm. In that two years that they reduced marketing spend, Dabar's profit went up. Obviously. Yeah. But after those two years, their market share began to decline. So what they did was to show higher profit so that their market price would go up. After two years, the market punished them so badly because mm -hmm. they started losing market share because they did not spend money on marketing. So that is the power of marketing. Yeah. There is, means I, there is no easy way to say it hurts yep. you. Because the money that you spend today on marketing, the results will come after a few years. But that mm. result are so far long term and so far reaching that people who can muster the courage to invest in marketing, you will see those companies will have far longer duration. Right. I think I think that you you made some excellent points here, Prashant. And to conclude this. I want to quickly jump to your book that was the biography of a failed venture, right? And mm -hmm. uh, over there, I, I've I've gone through the book, and uh, I think I was I was pretty amazed, and it was it was really fascinating to see someone talk about failure in such a raw form because it is a very less talked about subject. Every day we see more failures than uh, successful stories around us, but actually the ones who make it big are the more lucrative ones, right? But the way you've spoken about failure in your book, I think it's it's really, it gives a reality check to everyone. And it's not too, it's not, a, and it's not a very pessimistic book either. It's just a very realist book and it, it takes optimism to a more real level where you should be excited about your product and you're showing enthusiasm and optimism about your uh, venture all uh, throughout. But you also so, uh, showed the ground picture. We are talking about how you, actually uh, you know learn from the best uh, where uh, the your the people who are your mentor Kishore Biani and who not and but then you see how you face it I'm not going to say much about it I'm going to let others read it but I just want to say I just want you to give a little uh, context on how the fa like what was your failure story and how it changed your perception towards failure and what did you come to know about society's perception of failure yeah, first of all, thank you so much for buying and reading the book and obviously mm. talking about it on your podcast. So yeah, yes. Uh, so for me in 2017, I decided to become an entrepreneur after spending 23, 24 years in the corporate world where mm. I, you know, not just did I make money, but I actually made a lot of money. And my yeah. greed for money was so, so high uh, mm. that I, I, I wanted to, my net worth to go from 20 crores to 2000 crores. That is the mm. kind of vision I or I wanted to dream. Mm. And I saw the way to move from 20 to 200, my first target. I could not have done that by being an investor. 
So I said the yeah. only way to do this is by becoming entrepreneur. I was also like so many people today, got enamored by what I was reading in Economic Times in terms of businesses and the way they were getting valued. And I said, if I am even reasonably successful, I probably two hundred dream to two hundred crores I will make in five years time or ten years time. So my business started on the wrong footing. I did not start the business because I was passionate about the product or about the service. I started the business because I want to create wealth. Create wealth can be a goal, but it cannot be a purpose. And without purpose, there cannot be any business. Is what I learned later the hard way. But what happened is I I started in two thousand seventeen. But one thing I will tell your viewers or listeners mm-hmm. that uh, once I decided to commit to this, uh, I left no stone unturned. I probably, mm-hmm. in my view, even today believe we built a kick-ass product. We had a mm-hmm. uh, it was a sports shoe company very similar to a Nike or Adidas or a Reebok. Uh, mm-hmm. but the idea was to give you a product which was in between a bata and a nike a mid price point very very technology intensive shoe our design center was in portland in usa we had a whole development center in china and uh, because sh- sport shoe is something that uh, one needs to wear it to feel it because that is something mm. which directly impacts your knee uh, rather than just selling online we opened 17 stores in seven cities in 3 months time that is how mm. confident we were about the product we spoke about building the brand uh, we invested a lot of money in a brand so we had hardik pande anil kumble farhan akhtar as our brand ambassadors our first mm. campaign diwali campaign was 4 crore of rupees that's the money we spent uh, in our view we did everything right and despite mm. that uh, my business lost 30 crores in in 30 months so mm. that was the uh, the velocity of the fall i our store our our launch was on 21st august 2018 and on 21st mm. august 2019 after losing 30 crores i shut the business down and uh, immediately after i shut the business down i went and joined private equity firm everstone capital and then was seconded on to burger king i got busy with the burger king ipo so on and so forth i did not get the time it was my way uh, of hiding behind this colossal failure of my entrepreneurial venture but as luck would have it uh, come february march we all got hit by covid mm. and we were all under lockdown the first famous lockdown yeah. and when you are under lockdown you have a lot of time in hand and yeah. that is the time the first phase of my lockdown i spent time just watching netflix and doing time pass and some work mm. but uh, after a while how much netflix can you watch Yeah. and that's where i started reading mm. i i anyways used to love reading i had like lost touch with reading but then i got back into reading and it was while reading a, a thought that occurred to me and i started reflecting back on on why if i failed the first phase was about denial i did not mm. want to accept the fact that i failed i was mm. always trying to put the blame on someone Uh, it was as if the whole universe has conspired against me and my business yeah. and when that first phase of denial went away what emerged were only facts right and when i then looked deeper into it and uh, and i saw my daughters one question kept coming back to me prashant this is not your wealth that you have destroyed it is their wealth that you have destroyed at least right. i owe an explanation to my daughters why their dad lost so much of their money i mm. needed to be honest about it so what i did is i started writing down the first was just write down the mistakes that i thought i made mm. uh and when i was writing down those mistakes i also wanted to see what other people have written about mistakes are there any similarity to the mistakes i made and being mm. an equity research background at time during lockdown i started doing a lot of research on trying to find out entrepreneurs like me who made mistakes like me but that's when i unfortunately realized that uh, you know there aren't people who are writing about mistakes mistakes when i spoke to people talked one thing kept coming back that in our society mistakes are looked down upon there yes. is a certain word that i use in my book called moral degeneracy uh, mm. there is morality attached to mistakes uh, you yeah. look down upon people who have made mistakes and it starts with our school right if you make a mistake your teacher will punish you so mistakes are presented to us in the form that these are bad evil they are not the the rams of the world mistakes are the ravans of the world 
and yeah. as a result of this the whole society kind of tries to hide mistake very fast uh, i did lot of uh, i read lot of books on neurobiology and they say everything you know every minute there is a certain billion bits of information that comes to our brains brain acts like a deleting device you can only remember few things mm-hmm. so what the brain does what it thinks is not important it just deletes and you know the way brain stores information is such that whatever is important is stored in a manner that you can access that so today if yeah. i were to tell you uh, uh harsh which is your most happiest moment in life it will be easy for your brain to go and retrieve that information because it is important it has stored it in an important folder mistakes because they are seen as something bad brain puts it so far away that we as a society we don't even want to revisit our mistakes we don't want to look at our mistakes but when i looked at my life and i saw that i lost my father when i was 7 years old mm. and somebody who did not have a father who do you look up to and when i actually went into that level of thinking i realized my biggest teacher in my life has been mistakes every mistake that i have made in my life has taught and i said if mistakes has this big a power to teach why are mistakes not the cornerstone or center stage why are mistakes not been spoken about it is the biggest guru that you have and that's when an idea started forming and i started writing about these mistakes for my daughters the first level was only writing about these mistakes this is the mistake i did i started the business for money wrong it should have been started for a purpose but then i went one level deep and two levels deep but why why was money so important to me and when i went to the second and third levels of why a very different thought process emerged you were then being if i can use the word almost being naked to yourself you were being very yeah. brutally honest that that greed had to do with my fa- i me losing my father yeah. because when i lost my father and we were very very poor when i was you know growing up uh when i would see my friends going out for a meal we spoke about puchka early uh, yes uh, eating eating puchka in a in a city like calcutta was a luxury that we would get once in 3 or 6 months we were so poor and because i was so poor very early in my life one thing became very core of who i am that growing up i will never be poor again i wanted to be rich i wanted to be very rich and that that dna change that happened during my childhood was the reason i wanted my 20 to become 200 and 200 to become 2000 crores so i then went deeper into every mistake as to why i made those mistakes and when i started noting all those down you know you were writing 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 and that's where the thought came ki are it looks interesting can this become a book and can if and you know gandhi ji has this quote be the be the change you wish to see if yeah. i want to if my wish is to see that change where mistakes uh you know are spoken where mistakes are celebrated where the other people can learn from other people's mistakes uh then i will have to do something about it right be the wish you want to be the change you wish to see so i said okay then why not write a book so i kind of it took a form of a book i went to harper collins they agreed to publish the book and hence the book happened there that's that's a very inspiring story prashant and i think many of us who are even listening to it right now will be able to relate to it so yeah and if uh, so if at today's point prashant if there is one thing that you could do differently and have the same business come on board what would be it i agree that you are you, you have already established that you know the, you started it your hope was to build wealth but let's say if you had to do one thing differently apart from that today what would it be so two things not one thing first thing if okay. i were to now restart this piece i will ask myself i am am i really passionate about the product or the service that i am trying to sell it goes back to the first question we discussed on the on the podcast yes i will not start the business if i am starting the business to make money that's the wrong start i will okay. start the business if i think there is a problem that i am solving and i am very passionate about solving the problem and if the answer to that will be a no i will not take the first step also the second thing assuming the answer to that is yes i will try to set up business like running a marathon i in my previous venture i tried to run my business uh and any business is a marathon i tried to run the marathon like a 100 meter race 
I was in a terrible hurry uh, to mm-hmm. get rich quick. And as a result of this, I took the high risk, high reward bet. I opened 17 stores in seven cities in three months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was no gun on my head to do that. I could have started with two stores, make mistakes, learned, course corrected, then scaled up. But I was so much in a hurry. And also my arrogance was so high that I thought I had three aces in my hand. And I said, yeah, nikka hai, you have to go all in, right? I can't be then yeah. playing in the back foot. Fact of the matter is, forget three nikka. My cards were blind. I did not even know what cards I had. But I right. thought that these are three. So yeah, the second thing I would change is if I were passionate about a product, if I start, I will now start small. Yeah. I share in my book a, a story of DMART and Future Group. Yeah. And I, I share that story about the tortoise and the uh, and the and the rabbit, and I say yep. in the end, the tortoise yep. always wins, because business is a marathon. It doesn't matter, even if you start mm. small, but once you perfect your business model, then nobody can touch you, nobody can beat you. So yes, these are the two things I would change here. Yeah, I feel like we missed out on one very important topic, which came to my mind when you spoke about who you started your venture with, mm. which was uh, starting. If you're starting a startup. I think another important part is starting it with the right people. It's it's kind of like a marriage, right? If you're starting a product with someone and a divorce is not going to just cost you a, a shit ton, but there are a lot of people on the stake who are going to suffer from it. So that is one thing. And you like the idea that you have in your head, the baby, that some will sure. suffer as well. Yeah. And if you look at successful businesses, whether it is Infosys, Reliance, you spoke about Google, Microsoft, uh, mm-hmm. uh, even Amazon, all, most of these businesses, you would see it, there will be two or three or more people behind this. I spoke about Farmies, there are five people behind it. Uh, Flipkart, mm-hmm. there were two people behind it. So yes, uh, you need a strong partner with you when you start something uh, because uh, as you start and embark, And, uh, you know, if you are even reasonably successful, there will be so much of work that it's important that you have somebody with you along the way who you trust. Yeah, and it's also that, you know, if you're growing a company, it's not just about the co-founder or the person you're finding it with. It's also about the uh, nature of people that you employ. Because if you're talking about Mm. a huge corporation, there are a lot of things, like a lot of... uh, uh, this blank spaces and these bottlenecks that they have. They have internal politics, they have internal discussions, a lot of stakeholders and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So a lot of work is like, a, not a lot of work gets done in a, a small amount of time. But when it's a startup, right, you need you need self-starter people. You need people to believe in your idea as well as, as much as you do. They need to be mm-hmm. actively uh, engaged in contributing to it and creating something mm-hmm that actually, you know, resonates and you know, like having, having a belief or, you know, wanting to create something that resonates with you. So it's a True. lot of things. I think, I think having the team is an integrate part of the story that everyone knows, but the significance of it is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Hold up. 